be available uh, very soon, in fact, hopefully at the start of the year. It is in Italian, so just be warned for those of you who are rushing to Amazon to buy it. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm sure that uh, we are going to have a, a fascinating evening, and uh, with that, I hand over to you, Dr. DeComico. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for, for being here. I hope that people on the line will be able to, to listen to us uh, soon. So um, I'm very excited to, to make this presentation. I have already done this presentation several times, but uh, every time it's, uh, I tell you already, I will get moved at a certain point I will, because th this story is it's so fascinating itself and it's, it, it really uh, matches a lot with, uh, I mean, with, my, with my life. He, Takashi Nagai has become really a big companion for my life since I met him uh, two or three years ago. Let me tell you where this comes from, because this is important, because this is not just an intellectual interest. So two or three years ago, uh, me and my friends in Italy, I was in Italy at the time, we had the pleasure to, uh, to read the book uh, that was written by Father Glean, who is an Australian uh, uh, in, the, in the Western countries. There's a huge cultural event in Italy which is held every summer, which is actually the largest cultural event in, in Europe. Uh, just to give you an idea, last summer when we, port we, we prepared an exhibition about Takashi Nagai and we presented it in this, uh, it's called the uh, Rimini meeting for the friendship among people. There were, uh, in, in the meeting itself, there were uh, 800,000 people attending the event and several tens of thousands uh, uh, watched this, uh, um, attended this exhibition and they were really impressed by the, his, by the story of Takashi Nagai and the story of Christianity in Japan, which was completely unknown to them. And after that, there was the lockdown here in Italy. I moved to Japan, here in Japan, and they kept on asking uh, me and my, my uh, other friends with whom we organized this to have presentations on Takashi Nagai. And this has become, this has gone through five continents. I've done presentations like this really on uh, via uh, virtual on five continents. And now I want to to, to show you why this is so fascinating. So let's start and get to know uh, who Takashi Nagai was. So Takashi Nagai was born in 1908 in uh, Shimane, uh, in, in Matsue. Uh, Shimane is in the south of Japan, pretty close to Hiroshima, a bit north of uh, Hiroshima. And uh, so you can see here on the map where Shimane is and also where Nagasaki is, because we, the, our story will move pretty soon to, uh, to Nagasaki. He spent his uh, uh, childhood not in Matsue, but just uh, uh, in the, on the south, 30 kilometers south of Matsue, in the countryside. That is his actual uh, house where he grew, grew up when he was uh, a child. Uh, and though th there is a picture of him uh, with his um, parents. His fa why did he move there? Because his father was a, a doctor. He was already practicing um, Western uh, medicine. Uh, Western uh, style medicine, and his grandfather was a doctor, uh, still uh, practicing uh, Chinese kind of uh, of medicine. And he, he moved to the his father moved to the countryside to start an ambulatory there. So I just want to show you a few of pictures to to understand what his um, his childhood looked like. And this is his family, uh, his par uh, his parents again, and his family, his parents with uh, four uh, siblings, three. Um, sisters and one uh, and one brother and uh, he's the guy with the, with the arrow i always ask people when we see these pictures to look at him I, I i i honestly believe that since he was a child his gaze the way he looked at people and things was already different i i'm always impressed by how deep his gaze uh, is and how how beautiful his smile is and this is my favorite picture you can see here what i what i mean so this is the kind of environment he was uh, he was born and uh, and grown on um why was his father practicing western medicine and his grandfather practicing chinese medicine because he he, he lived in a period which was called meiji period which is important to understand uh, to, to understand the the, the 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 person of takashi nagai so basically, in, uh, as you probably know, for, more, for around 250 years, Japan in his feudal period had been basically locked in, uh, uh, in isolation uh, with uh, very few contacts with the, re with the rest of the country uh, under the shogun, so under the, the, the samurais governing the, the country. In uh, 1853, uh, Americans arrived for commercial reasons. They so, so Basically, they forced Japan to, to open the borders and to open to the contacts and basically to the uh, uh, trading with the, with the Western uh, countries. 
um, the, in the same period, the, uh, the emperor was able to, to replace the power of the, the samurais. It was basically the end of the samurais and the, the emperor, together with, uh, with some of the most faith, uh, um, faithful to him, he basically replaced and um, started governing the country. And the emperor was called the Meiji, the Meiji emperor. That's why this is called the Meiji period, starting uh, around um, 1860. The government, in a very clever, um, with a clever, uh, very clever vision, they understood that if they did, didn't want to be um, conquered, as many countries in Asia were at the time, they had to transform very quickly into a, a financial, economic, industrial, and military um, um, uh, power. And so that's basically what they started centrally, uh, really a process of fast, uh, modernization, revolution, revolution of uh, Japan to transform it into a big uh, modern uh, democratic um, uh, country. And it's, if you look at the picture of a Meiji emperor in a matter of a few years, this is what he, he, he looked before and that's what he looked after a few years. This gives you a clear idea of how the country was transformed. They injected a huge amount of money in the newly formed Bank of Japan and they started building huge industries. The, they, they started building uh, a, a strong network of uh, railways and transportations and uh, um, the, the econo economy started flourishing a lot and Japan s s slowly started becoming really an uh, industrial uh, power. In the same time they started with their military ambitions and together with some alliances with uh, the uh, British Empire and other um, other. Uh, Western um, countries, they started expanding in, the, in, uh, in Asia. Together with science and with progress from the Western countries, also the ideals of uh, uh, enlightenment, of uh, materialistic, uh, uh, atheistic uh, science came, came to Japan. And uh, that was a bit the intellectual environment where he, he started moving his, uh, um, started his, uh, his life. Uh, for intellectual, there was a bit of the, uh, the idea of science, which has nothing to do with, uh, there's nothing more than what you can, you know, the idea of materialism, nothing more than what you can, what you can see. In 1920, uh, he, uh, he, he started, um, before 1920, he started going to high school, and then he moved to, uh, to Nagasaki for uh, university. He decided to go to Nagasaki because Nagasaki was the, uh, the, the door to, of Japan to, to the Western countries, and that's where he, he wanted to study medicine in his most uh, um, progressed and Western style, uh, Western style. And um, um, yeah, so um, let's see what he tells us about his own way of thinking in that period. Uh, this, he wrote many books, so we want to, to understand with his own words what his mindset looked like at that period. He said, from my high school years, I was a prisoner of materialism. Shortly after I entered the faculty of medicine, they had me dissect cadavers. The marvelous structure of the entire body, the detailed organization of its smallest parts, all this aroused my admiration. But what I was handling was nothing but mere matter to me. The soul, a fantasy invented by impostors to deceive simple people. And what, this is what he thought of Christians, the slave of Westerners who dwinked into clinging to an obsolete faith. So he thought that religion was just superstition. He was in Nagasaki. In Nagasaki there was a big church which was used to, 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 to ring the bells three times per day. He was very annoyed by that. He said it's crazy in this period when Japan is running against pro uh, towards progress, there is still the superstition of faith. But he was, he was very enthusiastic. He has always been a very sensitive person and full of, uh, of uh, vision for, for the future. He had three big ideals in his life. One was Japan, the great Japan. One was humanity. And the other one was the progress of science. So he wanted to invest his whole life for these three ideals. In 1930, something which was uh, destined to change completely his life happened. His father called him to, to rush to home because something ha happened. And when he arrived, he, he, realized, he find out, found out that his mother had been caught by a stroke and she was, she was going to die and she was not able to talk anymore. And this is the last moment where he just was on time to see the mother before she died. And this is what he tells us of that moment. She looked fixedly at me and that is how the end came. My mother, in the last penetrating gaze, 
knocked down the ideological framework I had constructed. In the very last moment of her life, she spoke clearly to me. Her eyes spoke to mine, and with finality saying, your mother now takes leave in the dead, but her living spirit will be besides her little one, Takashi. I, who was so sure that there was no such thing as a spirit, was now told otherwise, and I could not but believe. My, mother, my mother's eyes told me that the human spirit lives on after death. All this was by way of an intuition, an intuition carrying conviction. So this was the start of a process of, um, of a long process of uh, dialogue and fight with his own conscience because he was, he was struggled between the, his ideological framework who was telling him that is just uh, fantasy, that is just superstition, and the clear intuition that he had, uh, which was so persuasive for him, so convincing, telling him that there was uh, the soul, that there was the spirit going uh, beyond life, that there was not just m a matter. And he was a very, he has always, he had always been a very reasonable person and he didn't want to abandon reason. So he wanted with his own reason in the full fullness of his, uh, his um, uh, strength, he wanted to understand the solution to this uh, dilemma. He started a dialogue with Pascal, who was a, a writer and scientist and philosopher from the 17th century, whom he knew from the, from the high school. And Pascal was very interesting to him because Pascal was both a scientist and a Christian. And Pascal seemed to tell him that it was possible a dialogue, not only a dialogue, but a synergy between reason, science, and faith. So for him it was like a, a bit of a, um, yeah, a reference uh, a companion to his journey, which still lasted for five years. And he started reading a lot, a lot of philosophers, a lot of books, but he says, for five years, I was deeply troubled by a little voice I heard, waking and sleeping. What is the meaning of our lives? I read the life stories of all kinds of people in my quest for the meaning of mine, but the more I read, the more complex the questions became. Uh, of course it did. I was studying others' lives rather than my own. He started realizing that the solution to the issue of the problem of his own life, his own conscience, was not possible to find solution just reading and with intellectual thinking. He was a real scientist, and as a scientist, he knows that an intuition, like he had looking at his mother dying, needs to be confirmed in experience. This is, this is the basis of the experimental method of science. So this is what he says. I am always ready to prove a hypothesis in the laboratory. Why not try in the experience, in real life, this prayer that Pascal emphasizes so much? And so he decides to do something which was pretty common in that period. He decides to go, uh, he was still a student at Med Medicine University. He decided to go to, to spend his, uh, his time with a family of Christians to understand what Christian life was in reality from, from inside the, the experience. And this is a picture of uh, the, 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 the quarter of Urakami. Urakami is, is a north, immediately north of the center of Nagasaki uh, around the big church of uh, current cathedral of, uh, of Nagasaki. Look at this picture, because in, in, uh, after a short time we will see what Nagasaki will look like after some, uh, a few years. So this is where he, he really went to live. He went to live 500 meters from this cathedral, and he, chose, he asked to, um, to be hosted uh, to, uh, by a family called the Moriyama family. He didn't know personally them, but he knew that they were uh, active Christians, and so uh, they um, accepted him in, uh, in his home. When he entered the home, the house of the Moriyama family, he started to learn about the history of Christianity in Japan, and he had no idea what the history of Christianity was in Japan. And often, maybe here, people here are from, uh, live in Japan, and maybe you know a bit more, but many, many people, uh, when I present this, have no, no idea at all of what Christianity, they, they usually think Christianity has nothing to do with Japan. Actually, there is a very strong and fascinating and rich history of Christianity in Japan. So this is what he learned very quickly. First of all, he learned that in 1549, St. Francis Xavier arrived, and he arrived very close to Nagasaki, in the, because it's the south of Japan, so it's where you get naturally, geographically, when you arrive from the west. And in, uh, in basically 100 years, uh, Christianity started flourish, flourishing, really. Just to give you some numbers, after 80 years, 
the, starting from zero, there were around 600,000 Christians in Japan. Uh, a huge part of the south of Japan, of the island of Kyushu, had become Christians. And some daimyos, some feudal lords, very powerful people at those time, had become Christians and were very happy to have Christians. Some commercial reasons, of course, but also some very sincere uh, uh, conversions there. As always, when Christianity starts flourishing, it's always been like that, any geography, any moment of the history, at a certain point, it becomes a political issue because Christians uh, do not obey to the power. They were pretty annoyed because Christians seemed to obey to a strange king who was dressing in white, who was sitting somewhere in Rome, which was a, which was a separate kingdom. And they seem to be not really following what the, what the central power was saying. At a certain point, it really becomes a bit of a, a matter of political order. And to make it a sto long story short, a really persecution, strong persecution started. Persecution started at the end of the 17th, 16th century, 1597, we have the first big persecution. And until 1641, to give you an idea, we have documentation of around 5,000 Christians who were killed and uh, um, but many more thousands were killed and we simply do not have uh, any idea now. So some, the, the first one was St. Paul Miki together with some others and now 450 of them have been declared saints or uh, blessed. So there's a huge history of, of saints, of martyrs, uh, tens of thousands of people who have who, um, refused to, to deny, to reject their faith and that they were killed for that reason. In 1641, the country, uh, the, the, the government decided to expel, to reject all the missionaries, all the Christians. They decided to, to completely cancel Christianity from the, from the, from the soil of Japan. And they, they were, basically they killed, they destroyed all the churches, they killed all the priests and missionaries, or they, they uh, uh, expelled them. And officially, in, by the time of 1644, there was not a single Christian anymore present in Japan. But this was the, the, the official version because actually many thousands of Christians were hiding and they became the people of the hidden Christians, which is like the Pope said in the 19th century, it was the miracle of, uh, of uh, Asia. Because let's think what this means. For 250 years, tens of thousands of Christians have lived and they, ha they have lived their faith and they have transmitted for seven generations their faith without churches, without sacraments and without a single priest. And it's impressive to, to see how this has become, uh, how these people have been um, faithful to this faith for seven generations. At the beginning of their story, they received a prophecy saying after seven generations, the priest from, from the West will come back and you will be able to recognize them because they will obey to the Pope they will uh, have a statue of the Virgin with them and they will live in, uh, in custody. In 1853, the Americans arrive, as we said, and they open the borders again. And with them, after a few years, the priests arrive. Be at that time, Christianity was still prohibited, but the government allowed priests to build churches only for the purpose of, of foreigners. Christians were not allowed. In the moment that Father Petit Jean in Nagasaki built his church, the hidden Christians uh, realized that the, the uh, priests from the West had arrived. You remember the prophecy which I told you. Exactly seven generations had passed. The Christians from Urakami, the hidden Christians from Urakami, they didn't know that they existed. They decided to, uh, to, to declare their faith to Father Petitjan, and they checked the three signs of the prophecy. And actually, it, this is what they were waiting for. After seven generations, priests having a statue of the Virgin and living in custody and obeying to the Pope had arrived. The, the Christians, of the hidden Christians, they were around uh, 30,000 at the time in the area of Kyushu, they came out. They were basically only in Kyushu because in the other areas of Japan, they, had been, they all had moved in Kyushu because for some time they were able to, to have some protection there. And they came out, but as I told you, Again, the faith was not allowed yet. So basically they, were, they, they received the last very strong persecution and they were again, uh, 3,400 of them were again captured and severely, uh, se severely tortured and more than half of them were killed again. Until in 1873, after several 
a, a lot of push from the from the foreigner um, from the Western governments, Christianity was allowed again in Japan. The people Nagai went to live with, they were the descendants of those people, of those hidden Christians. So the Moriyama family were some of the descendants of this hidden Christian. So he started to learn who those people were. He started to learn that they were not um, superstitious as they thought, that they were good people. He started realizing that nuns and priests and, and lay peoples were doing very nice things for the, for, the, for, the, for the city of Nagasaki at that time. And he started understanding that there was something interesting in there. In 1932, Nagai uh, graduates from, uh, was, was supposed to graduate, he, he did graduate in, uh, in medicine. He was a very successful guy. He, he, he's always been, I always think, if there was a party at that time, Nagai was the kind of person that everybody noticed because he was, he was a, a, a handsome guy, he was very, you know, very, uh, um, uh, yeah, outstanding, a very um, successful one. That's why they asked him to make the, uh, at the ceremony of the graduation to make a speech in, uh, in, on the in name of all the students. And, uh, and this is what uh, he, he would do, but the day before, a few days before, he went out with friends to celebrate and he got drunk because he, he liked drinking with friends and he went home under a heavy, heavy rain and he got ill for that, for that, for that reason. He got a severe uh, throat ache which became otitis and meningitis. And this, with, due to this, he lost the hearing uh, of uh, one of the ears, which was a, a very bad thing for him because he wanted to become an internist. And this was not possible anymore because at those times, in order to be an internist, you need to be able to use the stethoscope. So this was the second time in his life he went close in contact with the, with the, the idea of death. And he, he started understanding that life is not just a fascinating, exci exciting project that you have, but the, life is something that you, I mean, you have to struggle with. And um, yeah, he started another journey because there was another discipline which was starting in that period, which was still neglected, but it was promising uh, that he could practice without using the stethoscope. And that was radiology. He soon started being excited because we, we remember what were his ideals. He wanted to build the progress of science. He wanted to build, to help humanity with radiology and he wanted to make it big for, for Japan. So he, became, he started becoming an enthusiastic uh, radiologist. In 1932, he meets the, the daughter of the um, Moriyama uh, uh, couple, Midori. And they invited him on the, on the eve of Christmas, on the 1932, they invited him for the first time in a church at the mass. He, he said, well, why should I come to, to church? I, I don't believe. And they said, well, it doesn't matter. The shepherds uh, and the wise men also uh, who, who went to the stable, they, they were not Christian, but they did. And they started to get to know the, 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 who the child of Jesus was by that. And then he accepted. And he, he was very much impressed by that because he, he, was, he says, for the first time, I felt a presence which I was not able to explain and which I had never uh, felt before. And he was very much impressed by all those people proclaiming their faith and proclaiming their intention to, 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 to offer their life for the good of the entire world. This was really impressive for, uh, for him. In the meantime, the, the wars between Japan and China were starting. In 1934, the first war with China started and Nagai was called to, to go to the, to the war. Uh, this was a very tough year for him. Of course, it was the war and it was terrible. The worst thing for him was that his three ideals, they completely collapsed because he started realizing that the progress and science could be a very powerful tool to promote destruction. And that the big country of Japan, the big ideal of Japan, he, he realized what horrible things Japan was able to do in the war. And this was a huge, uh, a huge uh, issue for him. He had Pascal with him and he kept on reading Pascal and he had a catechism which he had received from Midori. And he said, I was keeping on reading those things because it was, I had, I was not able to, to put together the pieces of my ideas, my, my desires for life and what I was seeing in the war. And only in those books I was able to, to understand, I, I was able to find a, a sort of a light of a solution to this dilemma which I was not able to, to solve on, on, on my own. In 1934, he comes back for the war. Uh, one of, with Midori, they, uh, they had already two children and one of them uh, died. They would have another two after. Two would die and two would, be, would uh, grow up. Um, when he came back, 
he wanted to go to the church to talk with the priest because he is, as I was saying, he was really uh, struggling, troubled after the, the war. And he basically wanted to discuss this with the priest. How, how, how is it? How, how can you manage all this uh, horror, all this pain, all this evil in, in, the, in, the, in, in the world? It's very interesting because the father, uh, the priest whose surname was Moriyama, uh, not, it's not the family of, the, of his, uh, his Moriyama, it's another Moriyama, he, told, he didn't reply with, uh, with some dialectic explanation, with some intellectual explanation. He told him his own story. He was descendant of one family of, I told you that uh, in a few years before, uh, 3,400 Christians were all captured and tortured and many of them killed. He was the descendant of uh, uh, one of those families. Some of, uh, he, he's, um, some of them were killed. Uh, out of them, there was a kid who was killed, and his, fa his, his brother was with him. And his, this kid, uh, after two weeks of, of evil torturation, uh, in the moment he was dying, he told to his elder brother, uh, again, another prophecy, he told him, D don't worry, you will go back to Rakami, and when you will go back, you will be able to proclaim your faith openly. And he told him also, you will have a kid who will become a priest. And this actually happened. That guy went back to Rakami, and he had a kid who became a priest. It was the guy who was talking with Nagai. So this, he said, I am the demonstration of how struggle, if it's offered for the will of God, can really flower, flourish. And uh, there was also uh, another sentence from uh, Pascal who impressed him. He said, there is enough light for those who want to believe, and there is enough shadow in life for those who don't want to believe. In 1934, he decided to, to receive baptism. And he, he, he took the name of Paolo in name of uh, Saint Paul Miki, the first of the, uh, of the martyrs of, of Japan. And he, got, he married uh, Midori because they had got very close, as you can imagine, uh, uh, from this in, in those years. And Mido he told Midori, I'm a radiologist. I am destined to die because of my disease, because they knew. At those time, those who were practicing radiology, they knew, like the Kuri Kabul, they knew that that was their destiny. And Midori replied, Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Wherever you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. He said, whatever is for the will of, of, of God, it will be a joy and a pleasure to do it with you. Even if, they said, he will die before her. The years after were very, very sweet years for their family. Nagai was a, he, he tells us that he was a bit of a distracted fa, uh, husband. Uh, Midori was a co the column of the family. She was completely devoted to him and to the family because he was very much focusing on his job. He, he was a very good doctor and a very good father. Uh, he was called the good doctor by his patients. Uh, as you can read in the sentence here, he really thought that he had a vocation for complete, full, complete uh, devotion to his patients, but he was very distracted, as, as he said. And Midori was the pillar where he could really uh, um, lay on in his life. In 1937, he's called to the second war, um, war with China. The war was the same, but he was completely different. He tells us in his books that the way he, he, he lived the, the second war was completely different because he had something new now. He had the baptism and he had faith. He started doing things which actually sound really incredible. He, I don't know how he did. He was really fascinating, so he was able to convince people. He received the, the uh, permission from his, his superiors to take care not only, uh, he was the doctor there, not only of Japanese um, um, uh, wounded and uh, ill uh, soldiers, but also of the Chinese ones. And he got the allowance to do it. He had become uh, a lay member of the St. Vincent's uh, Association, and the, the St. Vincent Association from China sent him a lot of help and uh, support to, to, to take care of Chinese and Japanese uh, patients, which if you, th if you think of that, it's crazy. He learned a lot of things in, the war, in this war which will be dramatically useful to him in, uh, in a matter of a few years from, uh, from that time. When he came back, the situation was very bad, and these are probably some of the probably the, most, the, the worst period of his life. He realized that the situation in the world and for Japan was getting worse and worse. In 1941, Japan enters the war because uh, they, uh, Japan attacks uh, US. 
and uh, Japan and US uh, are officially in war. Talk, uh, a lot of bombarding and destruction starts in, in, in Japan. Tokyo in 43 is uh, severely damaged, if not only, uh, not entirely dis uh, destructive, dis um, um, destroyed by the, uh, by the Americans. In the same time, he, he develops leukemia and he was expecting this. This is his picture. You can see how the abdomen has become, and this is due to the spleen and the liver, which have become gigantic due to leukemia. Uh, he's told, he knows this very well, but he's also told by his colleagues he only has two or three years to live. He doesn't know how to give the news to, to, to Midori, to the wife, and he goes basically crying to Midori, and Midori answers, uh, this is the moment when I start getting moved, and Midori answers to him, but don't you remember what we said? Whatever happens is in life, whether it's good, whether it's bad, it's for the glory and the joy of, of Christ. And he told again, it was thanks to Midori that I was able to restart and, and live in those conditions. And this is how the years from 1940 to 1945 uh, passed. On 1945, August the 6th, a huge bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. They didn't know exactly what was happened because it was not uh, made it clear to the population. They, they realized that something uh, dangerous was happening. They had two kids. They decided to move the two kids out of Nagasaki, just four kilometers north of Nagasaki in an area which is called uh, Matsuyama, if I'm not wrong. Um, and Nagai and Midori stayed in, uh, in, uh, in Urakami, uh, which is the part of Nagasaki where they lived, as we said. On that mo on the mo three days after, on the 9th of August in the morning, he goes to, to work as usual and Midori remains uh, at home. At 11.02, the second atomic bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. And now we know that three days before, the first atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. This is a, a, a watch which can be seen in the museum in Nagasaki, which is still pointing to 11.02. It's a, everlasting memory of that moment. Um, the epicenter of the, of the explosion was exactly Urakami. And Urakami was completely destroyed. So there's beautiful books from Nagai who describe uh, what, uh, what happened there. Um, I'm, not, I'm not going to describe you what, uh, the, what people looked like and what the destruction looked like. I just want to show you some pictures which I think tell everything and we just look at those pictures. Just to give you an idea, his first impression was that the apocalypse, he says clearly, I thought that the sun had exploded and that the apocalypse had arrived. This is what it looked like. You remember what Urakami looked like when he, he moved to Urakami at university. So this is what, from the same perspective, Urakami looked like. And this is where his house used to be. He, on the, on the, um, he was in the university hospital. This is what the university hospital looked like. So he, he, he was protected, he together with a few colleagues was protected by the fact that the, the lab of radiology was surrounded by concrete walls and this saved his life. 80% of the doctors and of the patients and of the healthcare pro uh, professionals had died. In the university, 80% of, the, of uh, professors and of students had died. Uh, he was only severely uh, wounded on the temporal artery and he was bleeding. When in the moment that he was able to, to, to get up and a few of uh, the few uh, surv survivors, colleagues and, and doctors and nurses, they started uh, uh, medicating him and then they started taking care of the, of the, of the few uh, survivors that they were there. After a few hours, a uh, few survivors started arriving from, from uh, Urakami uh, because this was a few hundred meters from the epicenter. And they were in, in the middle of the destruction, they were protected. And so the few survivors started arriving to them. And the conditions of human beings, I mean, I say human beings because he, he clearly says it, it was not even possible to think that they were men and women. You, you could not even understand who they were and if they were men or women. So they started taking care of them. He clearly says the activities of rescuing was so intense that we, we were not able to 
to, to, to move to stop for three days. After three days, some other doctors arrived and they were uh, able to have a moment of freedom. He didn't leave the place for three days and they just were res trying to rescue people. He didn't go back to the place where his home was. He was hoping that uh, Midori, his wife, would arrive. He says clearly, on the same day in the afternoon, Midori had not arrived. And he said, at that moment, I understood that Midori had died. But still, he was not able to, to leave because they had to rescue people. After three days, he goes on, the play, on where his house was. And this is a, a real picture of him on the remaining of his house. And this is what, how he depicted the wife in, in one of his drawings, like uh, reminding like the, the virgin who is uh, as, assumed on, in, on heaven, but on the cloud, which is the, the atomic cloud. So this is what he says at that moment. My God. So, um, um, sorry, when, when he arrived, uh, it was difficult for him to understand where the house was and where the rooms were. After some difficulties, he realized where the kitchen was. And after some moment of looking in there, he, he found two pieces of bones from the, from the helium bone. And that was all that remained of his wife. And close to the bones, he, he found the rosary, which was completely melted. You cannot see it from here, but you can see on the back, the cross is completely uh, uh, saved. So he realized from that, that if everything except for the cross was melted, he realized that she was holding the cross in, his hand, in her hand. So he realized that she was able to die praying for the rosary, which she, she really loved. And this is what he says. My God, I thank you for having allowed her to die praying. Mary, mother of sorrows, thank you for having accompanied her at the hour of her death. Jesus, you carried the heavy cross on the way of your crucifixion. Now you spread the light of peace on the mystery of the suffering and death. Both Midori's and mine. Strange destiny. I had believed that Midori would lead me to the grave. Now her poor remains rest in my arms. Her voice seems to murmur, forgive, forgive. Of course he started crying and he brought the bones of Midori to the, to the cemetery. He then moved to the place where the kids were, and there where, together with a few colleagues, he started, um, he started creating basically a rescue uh, area for the, for the, for the patients of, the, of that area. There was, a, there was a source of water which was thought to be uh, useful for wounds from uh, Eustians, and that's where they started uh, taking care of patients. And after some time, patients from, from Nagasaki started to know that there was a group of doctors taking care of, of patients, and thousands of people started arriving. People started sleeping in the, in the forest just to be, uh, to be uh, cared by, uh, by them. They spent uh, three months there, and uh, after a certain point, uh, he, he started suffering from what was called uh, uh, the atomic disease. The atomic disease is something that usually started after one or two months due to the radiations. And it was a severe damage to the, to the bone marrow. So basically destruction of uh, blood cells and, and, and platelets. So he started basically, he started, he, his, his um, wound on the temple started getting infected and he started uh, um, bleeding. And then uh, the, the mother of the wife who was there with the kid who, had, uh, who was living there, she brought some water from, uh, um, uh, um, from the sanctuary that Father Kolbe, the Polish Father Kolbe who had lived in Japan, in Nagasaki, had found it there. And he said that when he was medicated with the with a, with a holy water from the, from the sanctuary, he says, I heard the voice telling me to ask Father Maximilian Kolbe to pray for me. He says it was a, a, a woman voice. I did this. I addressed myself to Christ saying, Lord, I deliver myself into your divine hands. The people staying there, he said that he was bleeding so heavily that he would die in a matter of a few minutes. But the bleeding after this started, uh, stopped in it completely. And it took some, some days for him to, to, uh, to recover, but he was able to recover completely. And he, he, he knows, he clearly says that he was miracled by, uh, by Father Kolbe. They stayed there for three months, and in November, he was asked to hold a speech in the church of Nagasaki, and this is the actual picture of that mess uh, on the 23rd of November of 1945, 
he was asked to hold a speech on, in name of all the, in memory of all the victims um, of, uh, of all the victims of the bombing. And um, he says something which is, uh, which created a lot of, um, a lot of controversies because he was impressed by uh, something that he, he, he had just discovered. Actually, the bomb was not directed initially on Urakami. The, the Americans wanted to, to drop the bomb on a different city, which, which, which was called Kokura. On that morning, the, the city of Kokura, which was supposed to have good weather, was completely covered with clouds. So they had to change their, uh, their uh, target. And they decided to move to Nagasaki. They wanted to drop the bomb no, very north of Nagasaki, where the Mitsubishi fabrics, and which was a deposit of weapons, was. But again, for, for an issue with clouds and for uh, a, a problem with the fuel, they basically had to drop the bomb completely random. And the bo bomb dropped exactly on Urakami. So Nagai, during the mass, says, it was all of a sudden completely clear to me, completely evident to me, that was the hand of God bringing the bomb to Urakami and asking Urakami the last sacrifice to that people. That was the people who had received Francis, Francis Xavier uh, 400 years before. That was the people who had made Christianity flourish for 100 years. That was the people that was uh, persecuted. Five thousands of them were killed because they didn't want to reject their faith. Those who had survived, they preserved the faith for 250 years. Those were the people that were enthusiastic when the priest had come back. And those were the people that were again caught and persecuted and killed in large amount. After all these things, by chance, after twice the target had to change and the bomb was dropped uh, randomly, the bomb fall, fell exactly there on those very uh, uh, little community of Christians. Little because it had already been persecuted and uh, nihilized uh, tw twice and now again the bomb. And after only three days, due to this, the, the, the peace was declared and the, the Second World War finished. So Nagai says, this was the last sacrifice after 400 years, another sacrifice which was called to this, asked to these people to bring peace to the entire world. And actually, thanks to the sacrifice of the people of Urakami, the Second World War ended. And this, of course, generated also a lot of controversies, which, uh, so not, not all people were, of course, enthusiastic of that, but let's remember that he had lost the wife, he had lost his house, he had lost a lot of friends, he had lost basically everything. But this is the reason why in 1945, he decided to go back and live in Urakami because he understood how holy that land was and he wanted to be one of the first people to restart life in, uh, in Urakami. And uh, yeah, this is a picture from that moment. He, 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 they basically started building uh, huts or some uh, short houses with what they were able to find and they started living in very uh, tough conditions. And together with a few friends, one of the first things that they started to do was digging into the remainings of the cathedral, of the church, it was not a cathedral at the time of a church, and they were able to find one of the two uh, bells. Um, this is the bell that they found together. And on, this happened end of December. On the eve of Christmas, people in Urakami didn't know, on the eve of Christmas, they were able to, to toll the bell to announce Christmas after four months that the, the bell had not uh, rang, uh, tolled. And that what was happening three times since, uh, since always, three times per, per, per year. And that was the first sign that they gave to the entire city of, uh, of, uh, of Nagasaki. The, the most impressive things for me, I have read many things from Nagai. There is one sentence, one thing that he says and writes, which for me was honestly, I, I, can, I can really say without exaggerating that it really changed my life. He said, it's not time to think of our things anymore. So he, you remember what I told you. He, he, he used to be a destructive doctor. He used to think, he was a good person, good father, good doctor, but he had his own things to think of. Now he says, it's not time to think of our uh, things anymore. We have to do, we have many things to do. And... Uh, he says, we A-bomb sufferers must not feel sorry for ourselves. We have work to do, each doing what he or she can. Every one of us, even the sick, can do something. 
starting from a couple of months after, he was not able to, to get up from bed anymore because of his disease, leukemia. So he spent the last years of his life completely uh, steady in bed. Uh, he was not able to do his job as a professor and as a doctor anymore, and he started writing books. Uh, the, the money of the books uh, you, uh, were he started using to, not for himself, not to build a new house, but to start building the, 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 um, the city of Nagasaki. So this is what the houses looked like in that period. One of the first things that they do, they start building, also with his money, the uh, wooden uh, temporary churches, which, which you can see there in the, in the picture. They started building a little book house um, uh, for a library for the children. There were a lot of orphans and there was not a book anymore because books had all been destroyed, uh, gone on fire uh, and ashes for, uh, for the bomb. They started building the orphanage. They started building the convent, the hospital and the schools. One of the most uh, moving things that he did, with the first money that first, with the first money that he got from his books that he sold, he, he, he planted 1,000 uh, sakura trees, uh, cherry trees, because he said life cannot restart um, other than from beauty. And everything, the, 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 the hills were completely uh, uh, destroyed and with no vegetation anymore, and he wanted uh, 1,000, they are called the, Senbon Sakura, Nagai Senbon Sakura, the, the 3,000 uh, cherry trees from Nagai, and they're still there. You can see them around the church and in the cities, in the, around the street. These are the, 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 the cherry trees from Nagai. And um, after, uh, in 1948, so after a couple of years he moved in Rakami, um, he wanted to, he asked uh, his friends to build him an even smaller hut. It's called Nyokodo. It's this one, and you can see it in Nagasaki, uh, still there. Uh, the Nyokodo was a, a two meters by two meters house because uh, he basically wanted to live his life in poverty. He wanted to renounce to everything because uh, life, God had, uh, had taken everything away from him and he wanted to give everything for the reconstruction of, of the city and for, for, for uh, hope and for faith. He started becoming what what we have to understand, and people in Nagasaki know, is that he started becoming really the, the beating heart of the city of Nagasaki because with his faith and with his hope, he was able to drive the reconstruction of the city. He, he became a, a reference person for, for everybody in, uh, in the city. Uh, he said, my head is still working, my eyes, my ears, my hands and my fingers are still good. He spent his day, he, he wanted to write, he liked writing, but during the day, a huge amount of people used to come to, uh, to him. Um, every morning, there were trains coming for, to the station of Nagasaki, and uh, hundreds of people, if not thousands, went to him to, 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 to meet him, because what, um, what they could find in him was hope and faith for reconstruction. And this, he was the origin of a movement of people, uh, starting from him, that was a, really able to to restart life in uh, Nagasaki, not only to build uh, uh, buildings, but really to restart the life in, uh, um, in Nagasaki. Um, many people start, he, he became very famous. His books became very famous. The first book was called The, the Bells of Nagasaki, and uh, there, uh, it was a really a bestseller, and it was um, the, the inspired by the, the finding of the, of, the, of the bell, of course. And he said, not even the atomic bomb can destroy the bells of uh, of God. Uh, he started becoming extremely famous in all over Japan, but also abroad. Uh, and people from all over the world started coming to him and, and meeting him. Um, uh, even Evita Peron sent him a, pr a present from Argentina, a statue. Uh, the, I have seen the original of a letter coming from the Association of Italian Medical Doctors, and I could read it in the original. It was beautiful words. They sent a statue to him to thank him for the testimony of faith uh, as a doctor and as a, as a Christian. The Pope sent twice to him a rosary and a statue in, uh, in, uh, uh, as a gift. The Emperor of, of Japan, who knows a bit of Japan, realizes how, how uh, uh, unique this is. The Emperor of Japan went to visit him. There's a big famous uh, violinist player, uh, Mog Mogevsky, something like that, a R Russian guy, 
who was very famous those time. He used to go around, all, around, all around the world to play a lot of concerts. He played a concert on the Nyokodo. Nyokodo means the place of love to yourself. So he played in his house, the, the Nyokodo, he played a concert for him and for the orphans. And he said, this has been the most important and moving concert of my uh, entire life. And there were many, many other people coming from all over Japan to, uh, to meet Takashi Nagai and to find hope in, uh, in, in him. So he spent his entire day meeting these people. And then he said, luckily, I'm not able to sleep in the, in the, during the night. And that gives me the opportunity to write my books. And he wrote uh, 15 books uh, all over. He said, uh, there's many people who come to, to me. He said, it's a bit of a bother. Uh, but since they are kind enough to come here, shouldn't uh, try to pour a little joy into their hearts. There's a video on YouTube from uh, his daughter who says that the, the children didn't live in the Nyokodo with him. They were uh, very close, a few meters uh, with, uh, with uh, his, uh, his brother because he was not able to take care of them. And the daughter says, sometime during the night, I had to get up and go out to go to the toilet because it was not in, the, in their head. And said, the, the, the light in the Nyokodo in the night was always uh, on because my father was always uh, writing during the night. And she says, during the day, I remember, she was very uh, young, she says, I remember this huge amount, huge line uh, of, a long line of people wanting to meet my father. And she says, he, you can see the video on YouTube. She said, if I felt like, he, he felt like he had to give a bit of joy to everybody. So he spent, he tried to give all his efforts to, to give a bit of joy and hope to them. And let's not forget that he was severely affected by leukemia and he was almost uh, close uh, to die. Um, so this is how he spent the, the last periods of, uh, of his life. There's beautiful pictures of him in the, in the Nyokodo. There's many pictures because he had become very famous. And uh, in 1950, they even did a movie about his life when he was still alive, which was projected uh, uh, in, uh, in the Nyokodo to, to him. And there was a beautiful song which you were able to listen. I, I, it's the, the song I was playing before, which was the song of the Bells of Nagasaki, which was played for the movie and which was played in the train station of Urakami. When everybody arrived in Urakami, this song was, uh, in, sorry, Nagasaki, this song was welcoming all the, all the people arriving in, uh, uh, in Nagasaki. These are a bit of the pictures of him meeting the emperor, <clears throat> him meeting Helen Keller, who was a very famous uh, activist for the rights of kids uh, and uh, the, in those periods. There is the statue coming from the Italian Association of Doctors. There is him praying with a picture of the Pope Pius XII uh, with the rosary he received from him. And this is the, the, the present he received from the emperor. This is the letter from the uh, Association of American Doctors, uh, Italian Doctors. And that is the picture of Father Glean and the, the book, The Bells of Nagasaki, which I'm very thankful to because all this beautiful, uh, this is through that, through that book and that guy uh, that uh, with whom I invited to join this tonight, uh, I got to know this story, and all this beautiful story of this exhibition started from uh, from him. In uh, 1951, uh, Nagai uh, died. Died. He was brought to the to the hospital. When brought to the hospital, he wanted to pass by the um, in front of the church for the last time because he wanted to pray for peace uh, in front of the. Um, of the church for the last time. He went to the hospital and the last words he said to the people there were, Jesus, Mary, Joseph, I place my soul in your hands. Pray, please pray. Um, when the, a few days after, there was the funeral. The funeral was hel held in the, re in the remainings of the, of the church. 20,000 people attending the, church, the, the funeral. And it was, it was really moving because at the time of um, of the, um, at the end of the celebration, they started uh, ring, ringing the bell of, uh, of um, the church, the bell that he, together with his friends, had uh, undigged, and uh, it was the first uh, um, thing that they did to restart in, uh, in Nagasaki. At the moment that the bell of the church started ringing, all the bells from all the churches of Nagasaki started to, see, to, 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 to ring. And all the bells from all the Buddhist monasteries started to, to, to ring. And all the sirens from all the factories started to, 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 to ring. Because the entire city of Nagasaki was greeting Nagai. Because everybody, sorry now. 
everybody in Nagasaki knows what was the role of Nagai for the restart of life uh, in the city of, uh, of Nagasaki. Every year in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, there is the celebration for the memory of the atomic bomb on August the 6th in Hiroshima and August the 9th in Nagasaki. There is a saying in Japanese which says, while Hiroshima uh, yells, shouts, Nagasaki prays. Everybody in Nagasaki knows that the spirit of prey and the rebirth of Nagasaki was thanks to Nagai. In Nagasaki, Nagai is known as the saint of Urakami. And if you go to, to visit the Nyokodo, uh, and if you want, we can manage and we can organize and we can go together, it would be beautiful. The Nyokodo now is in a street in Nagasaki, which is called the, the street of the saint, because he is considered a saint in the city of Nagasaki. I want to conclude which, with one sentence from Nagai, which I think clearly explains uh, who Nagai was, and this, it's beautiful. We have to transform our life into poetry. We have to dig beneath the surface of things. We have to look for the hidden beauty everywhere. We have to discover the glory of creation around us. Then each day will become a poem. We are alive. We are alive and a whole day awaits us. I want to conclude I want to show you a two minutes and a half video which we have prepared for the exhibition, which is really beautiful. And with this video, I have finished. And then if you wish, we have time for some questions and even to go and drink something together for whoever wants. So let's look at the video.
Thank you. And uh, Marco is on hand uh, to hopefully, if somebody has a question, I can pass a microphone so it means those people that are joining us online can also uh, listen to the question. So have we got any questions? Put your hand up and uh, Marco can run to you with a microphone. Well, I'm, I'm going to start with a question, if I may. I was very curious to understand what his relationship was like with the church at that time. You know, you, you described all of these people queuing up to come and see him, trainloads of people coming. And so how did the church uh, sort of interact with them, I guess, at uh, the time, particularly towards the end of his life? Yeah. So it's, um, I mean, the church was very, very close to him. He was, he, he had always been uh, considered as a, uh, he had always a lot of visibility in, in the church because he was a visible person. He, as a, and in the end, uh, he, everybody realized that he was a, a, a special person, and he was considered like that. But um, the first year were not completely easy for him, not, not really for the church, but more for uh, the, the problem of, uh, who knows a bit of Japanese history knows that immediately after the, the atomic bomb, there was a, a, a tentative trial from the government to try to, to shut up everything about uh, the, 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 the issue of the Second World War and even of the bombing. And actually, that's why it took quite some time for him to uh, to get to have his uh, his book books published. And there were also some people who were a bit uh, angry for him for what he said during the during the. Um, you remember the speech which I said that uh, the, the, the destruction of Urakami was uh, driven by uh, by God. And um, there were some people even questioning because he had become very famous, even questioning that he, he was honest. Uh, and that he was really living in those conditions, that he was really like that ill. And the government in the end decided to start uh, uh, an investigation for that. And in the end, the government had to accept that everything was completely true. And he was the first seat person in Nagasaki receiving the, the official uh, um, honor citizenship from the city of Nagasaki. So the church has always been backupping him. He's always been on his side, but it's not been easy. So. It was only after some years that he was his um, public testimo testimony was accepted, and he became so famous that actually his books, his uh, some of the extras of his books, even entered into the textbooks of school in Japan. Some of my friends told me that when they were uh, young, they studied uh, uh, some something about Nagai from the textbook. So uh, that's what he became. So the church has always helped him. Uh, but it's always been also a bit of a controversial person. Huh? Very good. Thank, thank you. Um, have we got another question? Well, it's a very shy audience, you know. It's, it's, it's there we fine. Go. It's, uh, uh, I prefer people to cry rather than to ask questions, like me. Um, th thank you for your lecture. It's actually not just inspiring, but also enlightening to see, to see, to see, and to be able to understand. The question is, um, obviously, um, throughout his conversion, it, from his first comments about Christians, enslaved Westerners, up to his last words, it's a very different path and a very different result. Um, being a man, of, a man of science is even a deeper uh, uh, path that, conver that converges both Christianity and science. As you, as you go back into what Nagasaki has become and what Christianity in Japan is, what would you tell us from your experience about Christianity today in Nagasaki and beyond? Yeah. That's a very good question. Um, I can give only my, 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 my personal opinion. So the first thing that, uh, one of the reasons why I, 
I like to, to do this presentation. And also the reason why, as um, Dominic was saying, I, I have written this book, which will be published in, uh, in, uh, in April next year, is because I keep on hearing from people, from friends, uh, the stereotype that Christianity has nothing to do with Japan. I keep in, on hearing say, Christ, Japanese culture is too, even from priests, Japanese culture is too far from uh, Christianity to, to, to accept it, or sometimes it's even impermeable. I mean, this is not true. Japan culture has its own issues like any other cultures. Christianity really requires conversion, which means that you have to abandon your schemes. Japan has simply different schemes compared to, to, to Italy, which seems to be a fully Christian country, but we just have different schemes. But conversion is something, something different. There's very few Christians in, uh, in Japan, but it's not, in my opinion, it's not due to the impermeability of Japanese culture. So, first of all, Christianity arrived 400 years ago, not 2,000 years ago like, like in, in, in Italy. In those 400 years, for 100, in 80 years, the number of Christians went from zero to 600,000. This gives you an idea of the possibility to accept Christianity for Japanese. Then, people were completely dis uh, killed, persecuted, severely persecuted. Tens of thousands were killed. And despite this, many of them accepted martyrdom, not to neglect their faith. So first time, Christianity was completely, basically abolished. Despite this, for 250 years, people, and this, as the Pope said, was really a miracle, kept on transmitting and, uh, the, the faith, and not tradition and rituals, but really faith for 250 years. And then they were, there were around uh, 20, 30,000 Christians left. Uh, of the 12,000 who lived in Rakami, 8,000 8, and, sorry, of the 5,000 that were in Rakami, 3,500 were persecuted and many of them were killed. Second destruction of the little people of, uh, of Urakami. Then after they got free, they were able to repopulate it. They started repopulating. After some years, they had become 12,000 in Urakami, and then there was the atomic bomb, which killed 8,500 of them. So why do we have few Christians in Japan? It's because Christianity in Japan has been severely persecuted and destroyed three times, twice openly because they were Christians and once by the atomic bomb. I mean, what can you expect? I feel a lot of uh, openness in, in, in Japanese people towards uh, religion and towards also Christianity and a lot of interest. The people of Nagasaki, if you go to Nagasaki, you can breathe the presence of Christianity there like anywhere else in, in Japan. It's, it's, it's impressive. Sometimes, I mean, you feel crosses here and there, but it's how people are, uh, what the city looks like, you feel that Christianity is, is a presen presence in the city of Nagasaki. So this is my, uh, my perception. What do I learn from Nagai for uh, our presence as Christians here? When Nagai met Christianity, when, after Nagai had the intuition from his mother that there was much more than only matters, uh, the material, materiality, but there was a spirit, he, he started reading books, but that was not able to convince him. He had to go and experience life, faith in life, real faith. So this is also the same for us. We will not convince anybody because we read the, 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 the gospel to them. Uh, Japanese people, compared to Western people like Italian people, they, are, they have much more broadly open eyes. They will see your faith when it is uh, live and lived. And if they will see your faith alive and changing your life, they will get interested. So what is going to, 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 to help uh, diffusion of faith? It's not proclaiming the word of God, but it's being the word of God, a living word of God. This, is, this in, in Japan is easier than in other places. This is my personal opinion. Maybe I make it too easy, but this is my personal opinion. <laughs> Very good, very good. Has, oh. oh, wow. You should be answering the questions, not asking. <laughs> as one of the priests, as one of the priests of the temple center here, I want to thank you very much. 
I've been interested in Dr. Nagai for many years. I've read uh, a couple of things that he wrote uh, and also a biography about him. But this tonight's uh, story, the lecture has brought on so many new things and I didn't know about him at all. Uh, my, my question is, <laughs> will this be in print? <laughs> is it, will it ever come out as a book? So, so, so I can read it. <laughs> uh, how is your Italian? Because <laughs> we have books, that, so the, the book, the photographic book, but it's, it's not only photographies, there's the entire story, exactly what you heard plus more, it's on the books there. But unfortunately, it's in Italian. If anybody wants to translate, who's able to manage Italian and English, wants to translate it, well, I'm happy to support. Uh, and in the book, which will come out in, uh, in April, which I wrote, there's, it's, the, it's the entire story of Christianity in Japan. One chapter is dedicated to Nagai. If I, the catalog book, the photography book, has sold a lot, uh, and I hope that my book will have some uh, certain fair level of success. If that is the case, it would be great if it would trans be translated into, um, into English. I will be happy to give you as a present our catalog. The pictures are beautiful. All these pictures plus many more are there, so I will be happy to give it to you. Whoever wants to buy it, it's there. And so hopefully it will come out in, in English. <laughs> And hopefully many other languages too. Well, yeah, I mean, it's... Um, I, I think we probably can squeeze one more question. Does anybody else have a final one? Well, there's two more coming from over here. Yeah. I'm fi with, fi with time, I'm fine. It's Thank you so much for uh, your presentation. And uh, I was recently in Nagasaki, and as you, I was completely struck by the city. I wanted to know if you knew about Nagai prior to coming to Japan. Was, was it him that brought you here? Um, what is the story behind your special relationship with this man? So, um, the, uh, I get to know Nagai uh, by the, from the book of by Father Glean three years ago. I didn't know about him uh, before. Even though I, I have been passionate with Japan since I was a kid. I started reading a lot about Japan, everything about Japan uh, when I was 13. And especially I, I, I've always been passionate, passionate with uh, the, the history of Japan. So I knew the, the, the history of Christianity in Japan, but surprisingly I had never heard about Nagai for one simple reason that you don't find the history, the story of Nagai in any book of Christian, of um, history of Japan and not even in the Christian ones. So you really need to know this book basically. In, in, in our language, in Western languages, English or Italian, there's uh, nothing more than this book. And so that's why I didn't know him, like I didn't know other beautiful stories, uh, which, uh, I mean, there's another person, which is uh, Mary of the Ants, Satoko Kitahara, which was from Tokyo. And she, she's an amazing story, which also I, I get to know uh, more uh, recently, because these stories are not anywhere. And um, so, yeah, this, this is, uh, he, he, despite my, my personal connection with, with Japan for almost, uh, um, for, yeah, more than 30 years, I get to know Tunagai 30 years ago. Uh, I do not exaggerate if I tell you that it really changed my life. So did, did that guy bring me here? Uh, my intention to come here uh, was before uh, getting to know Nagai, but it, it clearly made a change. It clearly gave, give, give me, uh, clearly gave me a boost and it changed completely my, my motivation and my perception of, uh, of being here. So it's a... Uh, I, I want people to know this story. Uh, and I can tell you that what impresses me is that uh, who, in, until now, I've, I, I have, I've seen many thousands of people exposed to this story. I haven't, I, I've, I've never met anybody who who's, feels like neutral in front of this story, which can happen even with big saints. You, a saint can conquer, conquer your, your heart or not. I mean, Nagai is so fascinating also because to be honest, the atomic bomb is very fascinating. So it, the entire thing is fascinating. But, and also he's very close to us. So he talks to, to us. 
something else which is very interesting is the, his, the story of hidden Christians. Now, uh, many people were impressed now during the period of quarantine, where during the period where people were, we were not able to go to, to church, to have the sacraments, to see the priests, many people were a bit struggling with this, like uh, asking themselves, how can I live my, my faith if I, I don't have the sacraments, which is a fair question. And they were impressed by the story of the hidden Christians for 250 years. You can live your faith even, sorry for the priests, even without, I'm not saying that they're useless, they're extremely useful, but even without uh, sacraments, uh, in the very end, the very core is just baptism. Potentially, that's all that you need. I always think also of Father Kolbe. Father Kolbe became a saint in the Auschwitz uh, lager. For sure, he, he was not able to go to have sacraments in the, in the lager. So in the end, uh, not even this is an objection. And the, the story of Nagai uh, in this period is really enlightening a lot of people. Very quick, maybe it's overlapping, but um, what, what, really, what really touched you, what about him, touched you and moved you so much to make you to do this? Intrig intriguing part of him, like the faith-wise or a perspective of faith or something in common with him that you feel dynamically yeah. to be united with? So it's, uh, as uh, the gentleman was saying, what impressed me most was the trajectory of his faith. Uh, what I like most of his faith is that he has always been a person of reason. And I'm enthusiastic by the fact that his faith has always had to undergo the judgment of his reason. He, did, he never abandoned his reason. The moment that he had the first intuition about faith, he had to, his, this intuition had to go under the tribunal of his reason. And he had to understand if, the, if nowadays is it reasonable to be faithful or not? And the answer to this was not in reading and in thinking, but it was in experience. So these are for me the two key words, reason and experience. When he had to prove faith in real life, he realized that faith, faith is the most reasonable thing, resource to live life. And the, he, his process started, uh, even with baptism, the process was not over. Because, as I was saying, he was still a destructive doctor. The atomic bomb took everything uh, away from him. After the atomic bomb, he didn't have anything anymore. What is impressive is that after that moment, he became fully happy and fully human. He's the living, demonstra living demonstration that even under the most extreme conditions, like an atomic bomb, joy can, uh, can flourish. And this is why I dare to say something, which I, I hope it doesn't sound controversial, but when uh, many people, when hear about this story, talk about peace, which is super important. We have to fight for peace, and we have to, to hope for peace, and we have to pray for peace. But let me say, there is even something which is even more important, and it's the possibility to be happy even if there is no peace. Because this is what it demonstrates. Even under the atomic bomb, even in the worst condition, you can be happy. If you have peace among people, that's even better. But to be honest, if you're able to avoid an issue like peace, in life there will always be something else. So what I learned from him is that you can be happy through faith in the most extreme and unthinkable conditions. So this is my learning from him. Whenever we have an objection, whenever we complain in life, whenever we are unhappy for whatever reason, we are just playing, playing with our excusation because it's showing us that there's no excusation preventing us from being happy. I'm sorry, but we are just, this is the most important thing for me. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, I think as uh, Father Carl said, this is a story that needs to be written down. Uh, you've gone a long way to bringing a community of people to being part of your enthusiasm, your infectious uh, excitement about uh, Nagai. So uh, thank you again for making this happen. Uh, I think I'm now going to invite uh, Elena, who's head of our Women's Network here at the Franciscan Chapel Center, to come and give you a small token of our appreciation. And can I ask everybody to put your hands together? Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much. So I hope that we'll have the opportunity to hear Gabriele at some future time again, either here and certainly uh, online. Um, we are, of course, in a church, and um, so we would, we're going to have a small retiring collection. So if you are in a position to support us, it's, it's, a, it's a tough time right now with our churches being closed and small communities uh, passing through our doors. So our, our coffers could definitely do with uh, some money in them. Certainly Father Cal will be insisting upon it. So uh, other than that, it only remains for me to say thank you all very much for coming for this evening. Uh, have a safe journey home. And thanks again, Gabriele, for a fascinating evening. Thank you. Thank you.